the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory to Him forever. You have likely heard the saying before that Christians are supposed to be in the world, but not of it. It's a very common saying. And I'm sure probably if I asked you individually, most of you would say, oh, that's a quote from the Bible. In fact, it's, it's actually not a direct quote from the Bible. It's more of a pithy saying based on a few different biblical verses trying to get across a certain idea. Probably the closest thing that comes to it is John chapter 17, where first our Lord begins to say that the apostles are not in the world in the way He's not of the world. And then a little later in the dialogue, He makes a specific prayer to His Father that He not take them out of the world, but rather protect them as they exist in the world. We also find a bit in 1 John, where 1 John talks about the fallenness of the world and how we are not to be entangled with that brokenness, that sinfulness found in the world. So there are different places in the scripture where we find similar themes, but this exact saying is not exactly biblical. And yet it's not incorrect so long as it's understood correctly. But oftentimes we misapply these sorts of things. Many times people use this saying to sort of turn their back on the world around them, on the people in society. But this little saying is more so about a tension. A tension between this age, the age we live in, the current, present time, and the age to come, the future age, the age that will come after our Lord returns in glory and the great resurrection and the judgment happen, and then eternal life begins. So these two things have to be held in tension against one another, and our readings today, both our gospel and our epistle reading, perfectly illustrate this tension. Now, our reading from the Gospel of Luke is the famous parable about the man who builds up larger barns to store up all of the goods and all of the riches that he has. He's had a very lucrative farming business over the years, and now he wants to enjoy the finer things in life. And so he says to himself, Soul, you have many good things laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And I think you have to be cautious with anyone that speaks to their own soul in this way. But regardless, Christ is referring to this passage from Isaiah 22. In Isaiah 22, it speaks about those in Israel who would, would basically sit back and not take care for the things of God, and rather just enjoy life without thinking about their Lord. Isaiah, though, adds something else. He says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we all shall die. That's the longer version of the phrase. And then the prophet goes on to say, yes, they certainly will, because they will be judged by God in his day. And so the original reference to this quote is about judgment. As we see in the parable, it is also about judgment, because God comes to that rich man and says, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. You see, even though the judgment has not yet occurred, his time has run out. And the only time that we have to make amends, to turn to God, to repent, to be changed, is in the time allotted to us before we take our last breath. And so in that sense, he is now to be put before the judgment of God in the way that he died. Someone who turned away from God, someone who was only concerned with the things of this present age. Now it's not that God does not want us to enjoy the blessings of this life. It's not that he wants us to live in some sort of constant austerity and never to have any sort of, of feeling of enjoyment at all. It's rather about how we prioritize our life. I was asked the other day about the Mosaic Law, the Law of the Old Testament. And someone said to me, what was the purpose of the law? Why were these all these prescriptions? Why were the Israelites told what to eat, what to drink? when and how to pray, to worship, how to interact with those inside of Israel and those outside, the stranger, the foreigner, all these things. And I was explaining to them that there is, as St. Paul says, the spirit of the law. St. Cyril of Alexandria goes into depth explaining how when we move from the letter of the law to the spirit of law, as St. Paul speaks about, it's not that the law falls away, but we understand it in a much deeper way. And so the intention of the Mosaic Law still stands. We don't interpret it verse by verse in the exact same way, but the intention still stands. So what was the intention? You see, for the Israelites, 
They were, as it says in scripture, a stiff-necked people, but they weren't any different than any other people. It's just that they were the first people that God calls out and makes from whole cloth. He makes them, he forms them from a single man, from Abraham, and puts them on this journey that a people will come forth from Abraham. And so they have to actually be better, be more holy, more intently focused on God than anyone else in the world. You see, the world was filled with darkness and paganism, and the Israelites were to be a light to the world, to show people who the true God is. And so in order to do that, in order for God to form them, to shape them over time, He had to give them a law that made every single thing about Him. So think about it. If every time you eat, you have to think about following the kosher laws, then you're going to be thinking about God. If every time you get up in the day, you have set prayers that you have to do at certain times, if there are certain feast days you have to follow on certain days of the year, then you have to think and be focused on God. If you have to worry about the tassels on the bottom of your robe like they did, what you're dressed in, then even in your clothing, in your dressing, something that's very practical, in that moment you have to think about God. And so none of this has really changed. In the Orthodox Christian Church, it is a way of life. It is not simply just a belief system that's thrust upon us. It is a way to constantly be focused on God. And so when we think about what days to feast and what days to fast, we are thinking about God. When we think about how modestly we are to dress or how we're to avoid ostentation in our dress, we are thinking about God. When we think about our prayer roll each day or what days we have to go to church that week, we are thinking about God. Because it's all about having Him at the center of our life. It's all about in this present age, having God as the purpose of living in this present age. The rich man did not do that. As it says, the rich man thought only of his material things, only of his wealth. And this is the danger then presented to us, that in this present life, that the blessings that God has given us, we will see them as an end in themselves. We will be focused on those things and in simply on the ease and the comfort that come from that sort of life. And becoming addicted to this, like that rich man, we will hear those same terrifying words. You fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Now there's something else implied in the parable as well, but to see that we have to go to the context of it within the gospel. Because the parable is given in response again to questions. Our Lord oftentimes gives a parable when someone asks him a question. Imagine how frustrating it would have been if you ask someone a simple question and instead they tell you a five minute story to answer your question. But that's exactly how our Lord imparts wisdom through these parables. And so there was a man who asked our Lord to intercede in a squabble he was having with his brother. So these two brothers are arguing. And they're arguing over the inheritance that they had received from their father. And one of the men is saying, Lord, can you intercede and make my brother give me my part of the inheritance? And so our Lord, before he tells the parable, says, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Then after the parable, he begins to explain to this man not to be anxious about the material things of this world. He says, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added unto you. And finally, he concludes with a practical a practical suggestion. He says, sell what you have, give alms, and instead acquire treasure in heaven. You see, the parable is about the man who was focused completely on what he can enjoy in this life, and all of those possessions he has, all of those riches in this life, those material things, they weigh him down. In a sense, it's like an anchor holding him in this age. And so in the end, our Lord basically recommends that if we want to prepare ourselves for the age to come, we would do well to lighten ourselves of some of these burdens. We do this when we limit ourselves through asceticism and then through fostering a generous heart through charity. Then we can truly live in this world but not be of it, as that saying goes. Now our other reading is from St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. And this passage is instead not focused on this age, but really focused on the age to come, on the future. He writes in the beginning that although we were spiritually dead, God has enlivened us by His grace. And he says, The Father has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the age to come He might show exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
So in other words, it says, if we are united to Christ in this age, then we are looking already towards the age to come. But there's this tension again, because he says we're already enthroned with Christ. We are already reigning with Christ when we are united to Him in His body, in the life of the church, through faith. You see, the age to come comes rushing into the present through faith. We are to stand with one foot here in this age and one foot in that future age. But how do we enter into this reality? How do we straddle these two, these two ages? Now, when we purposely strive to serve Christ, St. Paul says, he ends his epistle, his epistle reading with saying this, that we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we need to be reminded once more what it means to point ourselves towards the age to come, to bring that age into the present. As I always say, faith is as faith does. We must strive constantly to meet our Lord in prayer and worship, to bring the age to come into the present age. Those good works, those good actions begin with proper prayer, constant worship. And then we have to fulfill it in the way that we interact with the world around us. We must push beyond our comfort zone and find ways to be good, to serve God in goodness, to serve God through serving our fellow man, for example. In short, we must reorganize this age around that age which has not yet dawned and yet shines in our hearts when we have faith in Jesus Christ. So we can ask ourselves then how we measure up to this. Take a look at your monthly calendar, at your planner or your scheduling app or whatever you use to figure out what your week is like. And we can ask ourselves when we do that, say, what does that week look like? Do we list there the times of prayer each day? Do we have a list of when we're going to come before God in the morning or in the evening? Is that on our schedule? Do we have there the days of worship? Did we look at the church calendar that week and write down the days of worship that we are going to be there, the ways that we are going to come before God in the temple? Do we put in our calendar, do we schedule time to do good for others, time to help others, or is it all about us? Is it all about us and, and all the things that we want? Do we only list those practical things, those worldly things like our jobs, our chores, or the times that we're going to have fun? You see, how we prioritize our lives is a reflection of how we think about God and this age. The same thing about our budget. When we look at our budget each month or each week when we get our paycheck, when we start to look at that, how do we see our budget? Do we first set aside those things of God, our tithe towards God and towards His temple? Do we look at how we can be charitable to others? Or do we first and foremost think about all the bills that we need to take care of so we can survive, and then these things of God are simply leftovers, afterthoughts? You see, there are very practical ways in which we can live the Christian faith and have that future age become our priority now in the present. I know these are very pointed questions, it's not me that's asking these questions. These questions are being asked of all of us by God Himself. He's the one who wants to know how we prioritize our lives. He is the one who wants us to give an answer now so we don't have to have a bad answer when the time comes. We only are given this light, this light for repentance, St. Isaac says. So let us not waste it in vain trivialities. It is true that we Christians then are called to live in this world but not be of it, as the saying goes. We must understand that this is a challenge about how we live our lives each day, not about simply just separating from society at large, something it would be impossible to do anyway, but to live the life in the world that has been given to us. We are to reject sin and the brokenness of this age, of course, but, and to seek our ideal from the eternal kingdom, but only Christ can make that possible for us when we bring him into where we are. We let him invade the territory that we tend to hold back and keep for ourselves. So this then is the challenge we are faced with. So let us begin, while it is still day, before the night comes, to, be, to prepare ourselves for that day, for the day in which it will never, never dawn once again, where there's everlasting life 
and we will be standing in a judgment before our Lord and our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who together with his unoriginate Father, does all holy good and life-giving spirit, are worshiped and glorified to the ages of ages. Amen.